The Lord be with you. Today is Palm Sunday, and our theme is that Jesus is Lord. If during our opening hymn, anyone wants to wave your palms as if we're welcoming our Lord and Savior, you're welcome to do so. Hymn 443, Hosanna, Loud Hosanna. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, if we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves, and the truth is not in us. But if we dismiss our sins, God, who is faithful and just, will forgive our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Let us then confess our sins to God our Father. Most merciful God, we confess that we are by nature sinful and unclean. We have sinned against you in thought, word, and deed, by what we have done and by what we have left undone. We have not loved you with our whole heart. We have not loved our neighbors as ourselves. We justly deserve your present and eternal punishment. For the sake of your Son, Jesus Christ, have mercy on us, forgive us, renew us, and lead us, so that we may delight in your will and walk in your ways, to the glory of your holy name. Amen. Almighty God, in his mercy, has given his Son to die for you, and for his sake forgives you all your sins. As a called and ordained servant of Christ, and by his authority, 
I therefore forgive you all your sins in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Open to me the gates of righteousness that I may enter through them and give thanks to the Lord. This is the gate of the Lord. The righteous shall enter through it. I thank you that you have answered me and have become my salvation. The stone that the builders rejected has become the cornerstone. This is the Lord's doing. It is marvelous in our eyes. This is the day that the Lord has made. Let us rejoice and be glad. In peace, let us pray to the Lord. For the peace from above and for our salvation, let us pray to the Lord. For the peace of the whole world, for the well-being of the church of God, and for the unity of all, let us pray to the Lord. For this holy house, and for all who offer here their worship and praise, let us pray to the Lord. Help, save, comfort, and defend us, gracious Lord. The Lord be with you. Let us pray. Almighty and everlasting God, you sent your Son, our Savior Jesus Christ, to take upon himself our flesh and to suffer death upon the cross. Mercifully grant that we may follow the example of his great humility and patience and be made partakers of his resurrection through the same Jesus Christ, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Today's Old Testament reading comes from Isaiah chapter 50. The Lord God has given me the tongue of those who are taught, that I may know how to sustain with a word him who is weary. Morning by morning he awakens. He awakens my ear to hear as those who are taught. The Lord God has opened my ear, and I was not rebellious. I turned not backward. I gave my back to those who strike, and my cheeks to those who pull out the beard. I hid not my face from disgrace and spitting. But the Lord God helps me, therefore I have not been disgraced. Therefore I have set my face like flint, and I know that I shall not be put to shame. He who vindicates me is near. Who will contend with me? Let us stand up together. Who is my adversary? Let him come near to me. Behold, the Lord God helps me. Who will declare me guilty? This is the word of the Lord. Our epistle reading from Philippians chapter 2 is also the text for our sermon. Have this mind among yourselves which is yours in Christ Jesus, who, though he was in the form of God, did not count equality with God a thing to be grasped, but made himself nothing, taking the form of a servant, being born in the likeness of men. And being found in human form, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. Therefore God has highly exalted him, and bestowed on him the name that is above every name, so that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow, in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord, to the glory of God the Father. This is the word of the Lord. 
The Holy Gospel according to St. Matthew, the 27th chapter. Now Jesus stood before the governor, and the governor asked him, Are you the king of the Jews? Jesus said, You have said so. But when he was accused by the chief priests and elders, he gave no answer. Then Pilate said to him, Do you not hear how many things they testify against you? But he gave him no answer, not even to a single charge, so that the governor was greatly amazed. Now at the feast, the governor was accustomed to release for the crowd any one prisoner whom they wanted. And they had then a notorious prisoner called Barabbas. So when they had gathered, Pilate said to them, Whom do you want me to release for you? Barabbas or Jesus, who is called the Christ? For he knew that it was out of envy that they had delivered him up. Besides, while he was sitting on the judgment seat, his wife sent word to him, Have nothing to do with that righteous man, for I have suffered much because of him today in a dream. Now the chief priests and the elders persuaded the crowd to ask for Barabbas and destroy Jesus. The governor again said to them, Which of the two do you want me to release for you? And they said, Barabbas. Pilate said to them, Then what shall I do with Jesus, who is called Christ? They all said, Let him be crucified. And he said, Why? What evil has he done? But they shouted all the more, Let him be crucified. So when Pilate saw that he was gaining nothing, but rather that a riot was beginning, he took water and washed his hands before the crowd, saying, I am innocent of this man's blood. See to it yourselves. And all the people answered, His blood be on us and on our children. Then he released for them Barabbas, and having scourged Jesus, delivered him to be crucified. Then the soldiers of the governor took Jesus into the governor's headquarters, and they gathered the whole battalion before him. And they stripped him and put a scarlet robe on him and twisted together a crown of thorns. They put it on his head and put a reed in his right hand. And kneeling before him, they mocked him, saying, Hail, King of the Jews! And they spit on him and took the reed and struck him on the head. And when they had mocked him, they stripped him of the robe and put his own clothes on him and led him away to crucify him. As they went out, they found a man of Cyrene, Simon by name. They compelled this man to carry his cross. And when they came to a place called Golgotha, which means place of a skull, they offered him wine to drink mixed with gall, But when he tasted it, he would not drink it. And when they had crucified him, they divided his garments among them by casting lots. Then they sat down and kept watch over him there. And over his head, they put the charge against him, which read, This is Jesus, the King of the Jews. Then two robbers were crucified with him, one on the right and one on the left. And those who passed by derided him, wagging their heads and saying, You who would destroy the temple and rebuild it in three days, save yourself. If you are the Son of God, come down from the cross. So also the chief priests, with the scribes and elders, mocked him, saying, He saved others. He cannot save himself. He is the king of Israel. Let him come down now from the cross. We will believe in him. He trusts in God. Let God deliver him now if he desires him. For he said, I am the son of God. And the robbers who were crucified with him also reviled him in the same way. 
Now from the sixth hour there was darkness over all the land until the ninth hour. And about the ninth hour Jesus cried out with a loud voice, saying, Eli, Eli, lama sabachthani, that is my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? And some of the bystanders hearing it said, this man is calling Elijah. And one of them at once ran and took a sponge, spilled it, filled it with sour wine, and put it on a reed and gave it to him to drink. But the others said, wait, let us see whether Elijah will come to save him. And Jesus cried out again with a loud voice and yielded up his spirit. And behold, curtain of the temple was torn in two from top to bottom and the earth shook and the rocks were split the tombs also were opened and many bodies of the saints who had fallen asleep were raised and coming out of the tombs after his resurrection they went into the holy city and appeared to many when the centurion and those who were there with him, keeping watch over Jesus, saw the earthquake and what took place, they were filled with awe and said, Truly, this was the Son of God. There were also many women there, looking on from a distance, who had followed Jesus from Galilee, ministering to him, among whom were Mary Magdalene, Mary, the mother of James, and Joseph, and the mother of the sons of Zebedee. When it was evening, there came a rich man from Arimathea named Joseph, who also was a disciple of Jesus. He went to Pilate and asked for the body of Jesus. Then Pilate ordered it to be given to him, and Joseph took the body and wrapped it in a clean linen shroud and laid it in his own new tomb, which he had cut in the rock. And he rolled a great stone to the entrance of the tomb and went away. Mary Magdalene and the other Mary were there, sitting opposite the tomb. Next day, that is, after the day of preparation, the chief priests and the Pharisees gathered before Pilate and said, Sir, we remember how that imposter said, while he was still alive, after three days I will rise. Therefore, order the tomb to be made secure until the third day, lest his disciples go and steal him away and tell the people he has risen from the dead. And the last fraud will be worse than the first. Pilate said to them, You have a guard of soldiers. Go, make it as secure as you can. So they went and made the tomb secure by sealing the stone and setting the guard. This is the gospel of the Lord. We stand to confess our faith. I believe in one God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and of all things visible and invisible, and in one Lord Jesus Christ, the only begotten Son of God, begotten of his Father before all worlds, God of God, light of light, very God of very God, begotten, not made, being of one substance with the Father, by whom all things were made, who for us men and for our salvation came down from heaven, and was incarnate by the Holy Spirit of the Virgin Mary, and was made man, and was crucified also for us under Pontius Pilate. He suffered and was buried, and the third day he rose again according to the scriptures, and ascended into heaven, and sits at the right hand of the Father. And he will come again with glory to judge both the living and the dead, whose kingdom will have no end. And I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord and giver of life, who proceeds from the Father and the Son, who with the Father and the Son together is worshipped and glorified, who spoke by the prophets. And I believe in one holy Christian and apostolic church. 
I acknowledge one baptism for the remission of sins, and I look for the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. Amen. You may be seated.
Our text today is Philippians chapter 2, and we're learning why we say the phrase, Jesus is Lord. We really need to understand Jesus is in a whole separate category than anyone else who's famous or has responsibility as a leader. Let me just say a few names that you'll recognize from recent generations, and I bet you can probably say what they're known for. For instance, when you think of Tiger Woods, what do you think of? Right. And what does Taylor Swift do? Right. And if I say George W. Bush? Right, right. So all that's within recent memory. If we go back a little further, I could say Arnold Palmer, Catherine Hepburn, Dwight Eisenhower. A lot of you would be familiar, but those who are younger, really not at all. People are a big deal for about this much time. And then they're forgotten. But Jesus isn't in the same category of a celebrity or even an important world leader. We learn in Philippians 2 that God came down to earth. So Jesus is wholly different than just a famous person. So the phrase, Jesus is Lord, was spoken by people who met him. They knew they were in the presence of someone who had this authority, and they recognized their subservience to what he is. In the Greek language, they said kurios Jesus. Kurios meaning Lord. Jesus was Jesus' given name. And a lot of people used the phrase kurios. It was polite, like calling someone sir or ma'am. But they used the term really differently as they addressed Jesus as kurios. They were astonished because he had been repeatedly telling people he is the Son of God, a phrase that carried a lot of weight. And they were terrified that he could assess people right while he's talking with them and that he would be spot on. And they were really in awe that Jesus somehow had command over the physical that healing and restoration of life were possible. So when people met Jesus and they tried to describe to others what he's known for, curios Jesus. They said Jesus is Lord, meaning capital letters. Jesus is Yahweh, the creator of the heavens and earth. And he is an authority that all of us somehow answer to. So the Apostle Paul, who describes himself as at the tail end of Jesus' apostles, actually met Jesus Christ when he was risen from the dead. And so the Apostle Paul writes of this testimony to the Philippians. Have this mind among yourselves, which is yours in Christ Jesus, who though he was in the form of God, did not count equality with God a thing to be grasped, but emptied himself by taking the form of a servant, being born in the likeness of men. So when Paul met Jesus, he absolutely knew I'm in the presence of an authority. I need to do listening while Jesus speaks to me. And Paul comprehended that Jesus had been in his heavenly reign and that he had obediently taken on a body like ours. Paul learned from Jesus that Jesus did this so that there would be one of us to bear our guilt 
and be our Savior. It was a new thing. It was a big thing. It meant to Paul that this one, who we called Messiah, the one we anticipated who would be the Son of God, is actually here. So then, he writes this. And being found in human form, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. Did you know that these verses are actually a hymn that was sung by Christians as they gathered together? They realized that Jesus is both God and man, that he was crucified and that he rose. And so they sang these words from Philippians chapter 2 in order to show how different he is. It made them feel good and comforted that we as humans have one who is like us, Christ, who has come on our behalf. So too, in the hymn before the sermon, we sang the same. Jesus willingly obeyed the Father to bear our sin. Yes, Father, yes, most willingly, I'll bear what you command me. My will conforms to your decree. I'll do what you have asked me. That's Jesus humbling himself, being obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. Today, didn't we hear a lot in the gospel, about Jesus on a cross. What's amazing is how the people humiliate him like he's trash. They treat him like an animal or something they just want to destroy. We, along with many others of Jesus' time, know he did good, that he took time to listen to everybody who's grieving, that he healed people who were helpless, doesn't make sense. There's all this contempt against someone who's plainly good. They yell, crucify him and let his blood be on us. And as bystanders today, we're shaking our heads and saying, how? We hear how they scourged Jesus, stripped him, forced thorns into his head, pulled out his beard, nailed him to wood. All the while, people are jeering him. Okay. We remember his crucifixion. We need to know that he came for that reason. And so we still sing all about his suffering so that we don't forget his love for us. And laden with the sins of earth, none else the burden sharing. Those patient on grows weak and faint, to slaughter led without complaint, that spotless life to offer. He bears the stripes, the wounds, the lies, the mockery, and yet replies. All this I gladly suffer. We're supposed to be moved when we hear of his crucifixion. We're supposed to understand it's God 
on the cross, dying for me. He came to this earth in order to bear my sin, all that is not right with me. He came so that I might know in him I'm forgiven. This world and everyone in it has a lamb who went uncomplaining forth, sprinkling his blood on us so that we might know we're redeemed by the blood he spilled. Therefore God has exalted him and bestowed on him the name that is above every name, so that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow, in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. After they killed him, put him in a tomb, he rose from the dead and started showing up. It left everybody speechless. This guy who had been saying, I am the Son of God, is plainly still here and vindicated. They can see he has authority and risen from death they see he has exceptional authority. And this Jesus, in rising, has not come to punish, nor has he come to spread his own fame, but to invite sinners, the meek, the weary, everyone heavy laden, in order to see the kingdom of God through his eyes. As they see him, they're seeing the Father, and he speaks forgiveness and grace to everybody who knows there's more than what this life is. He is in a category wholly other. Jesus is Lord, and he calls you to follow him so that when you pass from this life and breathe your last, you will see him face to face, just as he has plainly said, he is Lord. Amen. Now may the peace of God, which is beyond our understanding, guard your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus our Lord. Amen. We stand for prayer. This week, we are mourning the death of two of our saints here from St. Matthew. Lynette Schilling, after a long illness, has passed away, and her funeral will be in Lockwood, Missouri, which is her hometown, on Tuesday morning. We're also mourning the death of one of our longer members of St. Matthew, Gary Creamer. Uh, his funeral will be here at St. Matthew on Wednesday at 1 in the afternoon. Let us pray.
Almighty God, grant us a steadfast faith in Jesus Christ, a cheerful hope in your mercy, and a sincere love for you and for one another. Lord, in your mercy, Almighty God, send your Holy Spirit into our hearts that he may rule and direct us according to your will. By your Spirit, comfort us in every temptation we face and in all of our afflictions. We pray that you will increase in us good works and a love toward our neighbor, that we might bear to them the good news that they have a Savior. Lord, in your mercy, Christ Jesus, risen from the dead, you promise comfort that we can believe in. For you promise that there is life after this life. We believe in this hope and in every word you have spoken. Lord Jesus, we pray that you will send your spirit upon all who grieve the death of Lynette and the death of Gary. And as we remember all those who have passed on before us, grant us the assurance that as we are baptized into your name, we shall surely be raised in these bodies and see one another face to face. Lord, in your mercy, Almighty God, we call upon your name to help all who are ill and suffering, and we pray that you would minister to them in this time of their infirmity. Please bless and heal Joanne Davis, Wilma Stone, Pat Hansen, Nancy Carson, Pam Buckley, Bev Miller, Carol Sanders, Gary Mattis, Vanessa Burmeister, Christy Chambers, Carl Morse, Lori Kepsel, Clara Lord, Tracy Wall Reinhardt, Dale Replogel, Fletcher Childers, Carter Young, Dewey McCommon, Tracy Redman, John Schwartz, and those we now name. Lord God, you have called your servants to ventures of which we cannot see the ending by paths as yet untrodden through perils unknown. Give us faith to go out with good courage, not knowing where we go, but only that your hand is leading us and your love is supporting us. In Jesus' name we pray. The Lord be with you. Lift up your hearts. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is truly good, right, and salutary that we should at all times and in all places give thanks to you, Holy Lord, Almighty Father, everlasting God, through Jesus Christ our Lord, who accomplished the salvation of mankind by the tree of the cross, that where death arose, their life also might rise again, and that the serpent who overcame by the tree of the garden might likewise by the tree of the cross be overcome. Therefore, with angels and archangels and with all the company of heaven, we laud and magnify your glorious name, evermore praising you and saying, Blessed are you, Lord of heaven and earth, for you have had mercy on those whom you created and sent your only begotten Son into our flesh to bear our sin 
and be our Savior. With repentant joy, we receive the salvation accomplished for us by the all-availing sacrifice of his body and his blood on the cross. We pray as he taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. Our Lord Jesus Christ, on the night when he was betrayed, took bread. and When he had given thanks, he broke it and gave it to the disciples and said, Take, eat, this is my body which is given for you. This do in remembrance of me. In the same way also he took the cup after supper, and when he had given thanks, he gave it to them, saying, Drink of it, all of you. This cup is the New Testament in my blood, which is shed for you for the forgiveness of sins. This do as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. The peace of the Lord be with you always.
we stand. The body and blood of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, strengthen and preserve you in body and soul until life everlasting. Depart in peace. We give thanks to you, almighty God, that you have refreshed us through this salutary gift. We implore you that of your mercy, you would strengthen us through the same in faith toward you and in fervent love toward one another. Through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine on you and be gracious to you. The Lord look upon you with his favor and grant you peace. This is our Holy Week, a time in which we travel with Jesus through his crucifixion and to his resurrection. It's a time of repentance, but a time of hope as well. So Thursday evening, we'll gather here again at 7 p.m. We'll have a sermon and a theme all around the Lord's Supper. And at the conclusion of that service, we will strip the altar of all of its furnishings while Psalm 22 is read. Then, on Good Friday, we will remember Jesus' crucifixion and all its meaning for us, that our guilt has truly been removed from us. 
So Good Friday services are 12 noon and 7 p.m. There are no services on Saturday, but on Sunday, our first one begins at 7.30 and then also again at 10.45. So you're invited to also remain with us for the breakfast in between services. For Easter, we normally decorate our chancel with flowers as well as lilies. There are still three available if you would like to purchase one, and the board is right next to the place where you picked up your bulletin if you would like to purchase one of those three remaining ones. Uh, I did mention right before the prayers the times for these funerals. I believe Lynette Schillings is in Lockwood at 11 a.m. Is that correct? Okay. And then Gary Kramer's is 1 o'clock here on Wednesday, and there is a half hour of visitation prior to that to greet the family of the Kramers. Are there other announcements that anyone else has today? Go in peace.